Blessed Sabbath, brothers and sisters. And I wish you a blessed, happy, full of success 2019. <clears throat> Most of you, if not all, I didn't see you since last year. It's a few weeks ago, but it's last year. Uh, I'm glad to see all of you, your shining faces. Um, I believe that you had a good rest last night. This means that we are going to have a blessed Sabbath. And I also would like to welcome all the youth, children, guests, all of those who are joining online <clears throat> to watch live. Everybody is welcome to our divine service. This is going to be the first message in 2019. And I'd like that <clears throat> when you leave this place today, you would be inspired to say, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Most of you know we have gone quite far in the story of Joseph. And today is not the last message. I have one more. But today's message comes under the title Family Reunion. Do you like Family Reunion? So probably some of you had recently, you know, this holiday season when people are off work, off school. You had some family reunion. I assume, I don't know, when you meet with your siblings, with your parents, with your loved ones, and even friends and church people and co-workers maybe, I don't know. But we like this family reunion, right? Unfortunately, in some families... And probably most of us know that we have, know people that, you know, there are siblings, there are parents, children, who probably would not come to such reunions. Well, today's message, brethren, is about Joseph, but today's message is about you as well. Because when we talk about Joseph, Joseph is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. And we are going to learn a few more things today, from the young to the old. And uh, I, I believe that God has something special to share with us, although we know this story very well, and we are familiar. Let us open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 45. We are in Genesis 45. This is our key verse, verse 3, first part. It says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. This is the moment when he revealed himself. We are going to get to that point towards the end of the sermon. But now I would like us to look chapter 42 from verse 1. And onward. Let us read a few verses here in Genesis 42 from verse 1. You know, Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt, the most powerful nation at that time, the empire, I would say. And through God's providence, he made sure that Pharaoh, his household, his servants, the Egyptians, Everybody during those seven years of famine would have bread on the table. So providentially, inspired by God, into those two dreams that Pharaoh had, he made that provision. Pharaoh appointed him as the second to Pharaoh in Egypt. That Hebrew slave. So now this famine was not only in Egypt... It was everywhere, even in Canaan, you know, in the promised land, it was famine. So now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, 
Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brothers, Jacob sent not with his brethren. For he said, Lest peradventure mischief befall him. And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. There are a few moments here I'd like us to capture. The first one is, Jacob says, Boys, what you are looking at each other? We are going to die. Well, we have still some oil, we have still some figs and pomegranates probably, but there is no more corn. And corn here in the Bible means not literal corn, what do you mean? It means grain, it means uh, wheat, it means barley. That's what it means, corn here. It says, go and buy corn. I heard there is corn in Egypt. He didn't have a clue who was behind, who was the mastermind to make that provision. But he says, get up, go and buy corn. And they get up and go. How many of them? Ten. Benjamin didn't go because Jacob, Israel, from here he is called Israel. He says, well, I will not let Benjamin go. And don't you think that Benjamin was a little... A little boy, he was probably now in his 20s. But for Papa, he was still the little boy from the beloved wife, Rachel. So they go down to Egypt. And the Bible says that the governor himself, he was the one in charge who would sell corn to those people that were coming to buy corn in Egypt. It's very interesting because some of the Jewish traditions say, actually Mishnah, he says, that the Egyptians normally would not sell to others. But when Joseph, this is what just, we, we don't read it in the Bible. But when Joseph came into power, he had changed few laws and he probably told Pharaoh, he said, look, we've got so much corn, we can sell it. And this comes into your treasury. I don't know, this is what Mishnah says, but we just assume that. So, one day, Joseph is selling corn to people coming to buy, and then he see, sees ten guys coming to buy corn. Do you think he noticed them right away, or he needed sometimes say, Oh, do I recall some of these people? Are they familiar? Sometimes you are in the marketplace where you go into the grocery store, and you see somebody and you say, Well, this face is so familiar to me. And there are people who look alike, but there is almost no one person in the world that is exactly, well, you have twins. But for Joseph, these faces were very familiar. He recognized them right away. He didn't need time to, to think, to, to, to look at them. Hey, come closer. He noticed them right away. Ten guys came from Canaan. <clears throat> now, the first thing what they would do, what did they do? The Bible says in verse 6, they bowed down. What did Joseph recall now? Young people, children, do you know the story? What, what 20 something years ago, what dreams did God give Joseph? You know, he was telling Papa and his brothers who really liked him in quotes. Oh, you know, uh, I, I dreamed, you know, the star and the moon and, and the uh, sun and then another dream. And did they like it? And they were bowing down and to my, they didn't like it. And now 20 something years later, he sees these boys coming, bowing down before him. He says, wow, God is amazing. His dreams were coming true. 
You never give up on dreams, young people, brothers and sisters. If God has put in your heart a dream and a passion for the truth, don't give up on it. It will be fulfilled. If not tomorrow, if not one year later, for Joseph it took almost 22 years for his dreams to come true. Do you think he revealed himself right away and said, well, you know what, I'm Joseph, nice to meet you. <laughs> Let's have a talk here on the side. No. Verse 7. And Joseph saw his brethren and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, whence come ye? Joseph treated them roughly, the Bible says. And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph, and Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said unto them, Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land, ye are come. Look, these people didn't have time to introduce themselves very well. And Joseph jumps on them in a way and says, oh, you are spies. <laughs> and what did they say? And they said, thy servants are 12. Verse 13. Brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. Oh, one is not? <laughs> Where is the other one? One is not. Oh, very good. Um, <clears throat> why did he treat them roughly? We, we know so far about Joseph. He was a very kind, very polite, highly educated, gentle soul, inside and out. Why would he treat his brothers roughly? Well, you might, your thought might take you and think, well, because they treated him roughly. They betrayed him. They sold him. They mocked him. They wanted, basically, they want him dead rather than alive. I like how um, Carlisle B. Haynes puts it in his book, God Sent a Man, page 138. We are going to read just a few sentences. He did not need... To inquire what, what sort of men they were 20 years before. That he knew. He was very familiar. What he needed now was to learn whether there had been any change in them. That's why from the beginning when he saw them, he right away as a counterattack, he said, Oh, you are spies. You know, he, he accused them right away. And he said, No, sir, no, no. We are 12 sons. And one is with daddy at home, and one is not. But we came to buy food. Look, Joseph didn't ask them how many, how many siblings they are. They told him. And they didn't know that this will bring even more trouble <laughs> in the later story. Now, my question, because I said this is not just about Joseph. This story is about you. Do you think that Joseph wanted to um, revenge on his brothers and he wanted to, um, to harm them and make them miserable? No. Do you think Joseph forgave his brothers before they came to Egypt? I strongly believe that. Because otherwise, this is my personal belief, otherwise he would have not got to the position he had when they came if he didn't forgive them. Let me repeat it again. He would have not become the prime minister of Egypt if he didn't forgive his brothers. He decided long time ago to forgive them. God has put forgiveness in his heart. Look, people provoke you. Maybe your family provokes you. Maybe your siblings. Maybe your parents, your children. 
But don't let hatred and that bitterness stay with you. You know, when somebody is bitter on someone else, when somebody is keeping a grudge and hatred on someone else, and you think, well, I am going to show you him. I am going to show her. And this is even worse when this happens in the family. And this was in the family. Joseph was not betrayed by a stranger or by strangers. Joseph was betrayed by the family. And you know something, let me tell you. I'm not telling you something new. You know that the wounds created by the family heal very hard? It's very serious. And the wounds he was given were from the family. But don't live with that hatred. This is what Joseph is telling us. This is the story about us. This is like, you know, you drink rat poison and you would expect the rat to die. <laughs> I like how George Herbert put it. He who cannot forgive another breaks the bridge over which he must pass himself. Wow, isn't this powerful? I like, uh, <clears throat> recently came across this story some time, time ago in her book, Mary Carr, uh, The Liar's Club is called the book. She tells a, a story about a couple from Texas. An uncle who remained married to his wife but did not speak to her for 40 years. No, 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 notice this. For 40 years married, not speaking to each other because of a fight over how much money she spent on sugar. <laughs> on sugar. So the guy got upset. She spent some money on sugar. She came home. She said, wow, God, this is, we, we are breaking our relationship, our friendship, our marriage whatsoever. So the guy got upset. What he did, he went, he took a saw, and he cut the house in two, two pieces. He filled the, the holes, and they were living in the same house, divided into 40 years. <laughs> Rat poison. <clears throat> Joseph forgave his siblings. He didn't keep on them. He was not... It's very stressful when you are upset on someone else. Actually, some commentators say when you are upset on someone else, when you are bitter on someone else, you are held as a captive. You know how? Because you always think, you try, oh, I have to avoid. I should not speak. I should not sit beside. I should not have any interaction. So you become the slave of that person. Brethren, you want to be liberated. Let it go. Joseph, let it go. Well, I know what you are saying from sitting up down there. Say, well, I know it's easy to talk about that. But in reality, can, can you bring a solution? Can you say something? Well, often people ask me the same question. How can you reconcile something? How can you make it peace? I have just one answer. The foot of the cross. Brethren, there is no solution. There is no medicine. There is no pilgrimage. There is no preacher. There is no body. There is no balm. There is just one solution for reconciliation. There is one solution to accept God's grace and forgiveness. And the one who has been forgiven by God. In return will forgive. His parents. His siblings. His children, his neighbor, that's the power of God. When you come to the foot of the cross, put yourself aside and let God live in you. That's the only solution, according to what the Bible says. <clears throat> so here in chapter 42, the Bible says he knew them, but they didn't 
know him. That was his advantage over them. He could test them, and they are going to pass several tests. <clears throat> they said here in verse 13, and they said, well, we are 12, and one is at home, and one is not. In the same book, God sent a man 141. It says, one is not, they said, then they thought him dead. That must have brought a lamp to his throat. They had said it with gentleness as, as though it brought a tinge of sorrow with it. And oh, that other expression, thy servants are twelve brethren. As he thought of it, he was gripped with emotion. Could it be that in that dear encampment of his father, his home, they still thought of the family as unbroken? Even though he had been given up for dead, he still belonged, notwithstanding all that had happened. He still had a place in their thoughts, in their hearts. He was one of them. Thy servants are twelve, not eleven, brethren. This, was, this brought a flag to Joseph says, oh, look, they still count me, although they believed me dead, they still counted as 12 brothers. <clears throat> and you know what he did with them? Verse uh, 17. And he put them all together into war three days. I told you, Joseph treated them roughly. He said, you are spies. We will see. He said, oh, I see you are spies because one is at home, so you are playing some games here with me. I, I will show you. Unless you bring your younger brother, then I will believe you that you are not spies. And he knew, he knew the full story, right? They didn't, they didn't have a clue what is going on. They didn't know that he, Joseph was talking through an interpreter, translator. They, they didn't know he spoke their tongue. He understood them. <clears throat> Same book, 139. Prison would be about the best place for them to do a bit of contemplative consultation of their own souls. It had worked that way with him. He, he would try it on them. There was no revenge in this, no vindictiveness. He did not feel vengeful. His most profound desire was to help this man. He felt compassionate toward them, but one great question remained in his mind. Were they worthy of help? This must be determined. He had one great advantage over them as they stood before him, and he decided to use it to the full to test their characters. He knew them. They did not know him. So what did he do? He put them in ward. He, he sent them to prison. How many days? Three days. How, many, how, many, uh, how long did Joseph stay in prison? Three years. So one day per year. So he said, I was three years in prison. And I know God meant it for good. So, but now you boys have to go and meditate a little bit. You know, He wanted to know. He, he was not revengeful. We have to be careful how we interpret the story he was not revengeful but he wanted to find out how will they behave in these circumstances and he said i fear god now verse 18 says and joseph said unto them the third day this do and live for i fear god look they didn't pay attention they were so stressed he said i fear god the same god they were probably now fearing. <clears throat> and verse 21 and 22. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear. 
Be therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Now, when they were accused of being spies, when they were put into word, you know what they were saying? This is because of Joseph. God is taking us, is keeping us accountable for what we have done to that young solo, young brother. And he understood. He was listening. He understood everything. So now Joseph is making conclusion. He didn't know them. If he would say, hey boys, did you change? He didn't ask them. He wanted to test them. See, Joseph spoke through an interpreter. Does God speak to us through an interpreter as well? God said, it's good for me to go. I'll send you the Holy Spirit. We just concluded a semester. He speaks us to the Holy Spirit. He, he uses other means and ways to speak to us. It's Joseph. Although he spoke their language, he spoke through an interpreter. Before he revealed himself. And verse 24, And he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. So he said, look, this guy will stay here and until you bring your younger brother, you will not have Simeon. Why Simeon? Simeon. Why he didn't pick Naphtali or um, Reuben or Simeon? By the way, do you know that Simeon was the, the one that treated the worse Joseph? He was actually the instigator and he said, okay, let's throw into that well, let's do this with him. Simeon was the mastermind. So now he said, Simeon will stay here. For as long as you travel home to Canaan, come back, or as long as you stay, Simeon will stay here. Wow. Bad news. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 225, on his return, he commanded that Simeon be bound before them and again committed to prison. In the cruel treatment of their brother, Simeon had been the instigator and chief actor. And it was for this reason that the choice fell upon him. I don't know if Simeon had any memories, but they didn't suspect a thing. But this was Joseph. <clears throat> what did Joseph do when he sent them back? Did he sell them corn? Yes, he did. Actually, he didn't take money. Brother, do you buy salvation? No, it's for free. He sent them home and the silver and gold and everything what they brought, they found when they got home, they found it in their sacks. They got even more scared. They said, wow, probably it was a misunderstanding. Probably they, they forgot to take, and now if we go back, they, they are going to accuse us we didn't pay for the corn. So they came home. I'd like to go quickly. Time is running out, but there are a few moments here I'd like to uh, highlight. So chapter 42, verse 37, they come home. Papa is waiting. And now, guess what? Whenever these boys, they are sent somewhere, one less comes. <laughs> Joseph was sent. He didn't return. Now, Jacob sent them to Egypt. Simeon doesn't come back. Now they come, they tell the story. And he says, what did you do now? And Reuben speaks up. And Reuben, verse 37, spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons. If I bring him not to thee, deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. He is, he is promising, he is swearing on his, uh, making a pledge on his sons. And what did Jacob say? Asking permission for Benjamin to go. And he said, my son shall not go down with you. For his brother is dead and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which he go, then shall he bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Jacob is not satisfied. Who spoke to Jacob? Reuben. He, he was the oldest in the family among the siblings. And he had that privilege. To go and speak first. 
But Jacob didn't trust him. And you will see a huge contrast in between what Reuben said and what Judah will come up later on. So for a while they were doing somehow, Simeon was missing. But that corn will come to an end. How much they brought on their donkeys from Egypt, you know, it was not for too long. Actually, again, Mishnah says, I have to test that, I don't know exactly, but he says that so much corn you could bring as one donkey can carry, and you're not allowed to have servants, just your own. So now the famine, uh, uh, chapter 43, and the famine was sore in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. And now Judah speaks up. And Judah spoke unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest to us, saying, You shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. I'd like you to notice something in this story. What Jacob will do now. Verse 6 and 7. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so yield with me, as to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother. <laughs> Are you catching the thought here? Jacob is telling them, Why? Boys, why? I send you to buy corn, and you start telling him chronicles about your family. I didn't instruct you. Why, why did you keep your mouth shut and not tell him you have more brothers at home or one? <laughs> Jacob was upset and said, why, why did you tell him? Why extra information? <laughs> but they were honest men now. And they said, the man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words. Could we certainly know that we, he would say, bring your brother down? He didn't know. And now they were truthful. J Jacob, in a way, was trying to twist here the know a little bit, you know, why you didn't tell, why you t told him. But the boys were not the same as they were 20 years ago. I'd like you to listen. Listen to me, what, what the Bible says now. From verse 8. And Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me. This is powerful. And we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Who? My children? As Reuben said? No. When Judah comes, he says, I will be surety for him. This means I will die for him if something happens. And the boy will come home. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned the second time. And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so, now do this. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down the man a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices and nerve and nuts and almonds. And take Benjamin. Do you know whose idea was that Joseph would be sold as a slave? Judah. Judah. And then in the New Testament we have Judas, same, same name almost, came with the idea to sell Christ, to betray Christ. But now Jacob would not believe Reuben, he would not trust when Judah comes and he says, I will be the surety. He says, take him. <clears throat> Verse, uh, they go down now, verse 26. They showed up, now they came with Benjamin, verse 26, chapter 43. 
And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to him to the earth. What did he recall again? Second time, they are bowing down before Joseph. Without knowing that this is Joseph. The one they hated. The one they betrayed. <clears throat> Verse 27. He asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well? The old man of whom you spoke. Is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant, our father, is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke unto me? And he said, God, be gracious unto thee, my son. They couldn't read be between the lines. He, he barely could keep his emotions. He, he would not cry Visibly, but inside he was already weeping and crying. And, and Joseph made haste for his bowls did earn upon his brother and his sought where to weep. And he entered into his chamber when, and we, wept there. And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, set on bread. This story really touched my heart, you know. It makes you cry, it makes you... Brings joy, and at the same time, when you look, you know, at this situation, he is looking at Benjamin, now a grown up young boy. He's not anymore like neither a teenager, probably in his 20s. Is this your brother? And he sees Benjamin, the one he left 20 something years ago with Papa. He has never seen him since. He can't control himself. He goes on the side, he, he wept, washed his face, comes back. Brings Simeon from prison. And then he orders. A big feast, right? Like they said, well, now you are going to eat with the governor, with the prime minister. Actually, Joseph was not at the same table because the Egyptians were not supposed to eat with the other nations. So he set a table for them. And then he would send food from his table, you know, like delicious food and meal, whatever Joseph was serving them. What's interesting, when you read carefully the Bible, he put them by age, from Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, and so forth. And then the last was Benjamin. And then through his servants, he would say, bring to Benjamin five portions. I don't know how he could eat so much, but he's got more. <laughs> and he wanted to see how are going the boys to behave now. When they see that he is Treated differently. He loved them all, brethren. He loved them all without exception. But he wanted to see, are they the same 20-something years ago? Or they have changed? There was no complaint. He said, oh boy, just, just eat, eat, you know. They are bringing. So, to make the long story short, he sends them back home. Now with Simeon, seems like they are like jumping of joy, Simeon and, and Benjamin, nothing happened. So they barely left a few miles from town and they hear the horses and the governor's people coming after them. And they said, well, how could you do something like that? The text says in... Um, the, the, the servant came and they, they were accused of stealing the prime minister chalice, or the cup, right? The chalice. And you know why? The, the chalice was believed that had power to, uh, to show if somebody was going to poison the governor or pharaoh. That's why the butler and the baker ended up in prison, because probably there was some you know, spying and some attempt to poison Pharaoh. So now he comes and says, well, some, one of you have st stolen the chalice of the governor. And they stop and said, no way. 
We didn't do. We, we don't need. We have gold and silver. We, we don't have corn. We came to buy corn. And he said, well, we will check. And you know what they said? The one in whose sack will be found, let him be your servant. Let the one, let him die. Same mistake. As Jacob did before when his wife, Rachel, was running from daddy. And what did Jacob say? He didn't know she, she had stolen the idols. He said, let the one die. And she died later on anyway. So in, in this story, what it says, he started again from Reuben, going, checking every sock. Like it's a big drama. And then it comes to Benjamin, right? Benjamin is the last. He lifts it up, says, probably they were shocked. They were looking at each other, said, it's impossible. They didn't say a word. Or probably you would think, well, they would have thought, well, we didn't know you're a shoplifter. <laughs> but they didn't say. I'm just assuming, this is my speculation. Was Joseph praying and thinking, will Benjamin come by himself? Or will they all return with Benjamin? He knew that the chalice was placed in Benjamin's sack. He knew this. Everything was orchestrated behind the scenes. This was the final test. If they pass it, for Joseph it's enough. So you know what they did? They didn't criticize him. They didn't turn and say, whoa, what did you do, little brother? You put us in trouble. How are you going to do now? They just turned back and they went. Brother, now let me ask you something. And this is about you. When somebody in the church is caught in a sin, when somebody is in a difficulty, when somebody is down, what do you do? Do you turn around, wash your hands and say, well, I'm good that I am not in this situation. I'm glad that I didn't do that. Do we behave like that? How did Joseph's brothers behave now? Although they were not guilty, they left everything and they returned with Benjamin. That's a true Christian, Christ-like spirit to support even when somebody is down. Not covering sin, but supporting, praying. Usually what we do, we let the person to go even further away and further away until he's devoured totally by the devil. When we came back, chapter 44, verse 5. And when they were gone out of the city and... Not yet far off, Joseph sent unto his steward up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 229. He says, What deed is this that ye have done? He said, Ought ye not that such a man as I am certainly divine? Joseph designed to draw from them an acknowledgement of their sin. He had never claimed the power of divination, but was willing to have them believe that he could read the secrets of their lives. He said, well, it, for many people says, well, don't you know that they have this power to, 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 for divination or something like that? It was not that. And let me ask you something. Did Joseph have power to reveal and interpret dreams? Yes, he did. So behind this story, he knew more than all of them together. Same book, Patriarchs and Prophets. In his deep distress, we, we, now, we now see they went back to the palace. And they come, and I'd, I'd like to read a few verses. From verse 14. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there. And they fell before him on the ground again. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? O ye not, that such a man as I can certainly divine. This is what people take it differently. 
And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him. Judah, Judah is the one. Notice he promised to Jacob at home, and then he comes near to the governor and said, O oh, my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead. Oh, <laughs> the other time he is not, and now he is dead. And he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou saidest unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may see. And he tells the story. And our father said, verse 25, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go. If our youngest brother be with us, then will we go down. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, E not that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And he take this also from me, and mischief before him. You shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he see that the lad is not with us, that he will die and thy servants. And I like verse 32. Pay attention to verse 32. For thy servant became what? Surety. For the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. Wow. Do you feel like some goosebumps on your skin when you read this story? What did Judah say? He says, For I put myself as surety. They would not do that 20 years ago. Probably 20 years ago, if this was done, say, Hey, Benjamin, goodbye. We'll see you. Maybe we'll send you some uh, candies later on. Not the same story. He said, I will stay and let him go. And now we come to the climax, and I would like to conclude with this. Actually, Petrarchs and Prophets 2.25, it says, During the years since Joseph had been separated from his brothers, the sons of Jacob, Jacob had changed in character. Envious, terrible, and deceptive, cruel, and revengeful they had been. But now when tested by adversity, they were shown to be unselfish, true to one another, devoted to their father and themselves, middle-aged men, subject to his authority. Do you think Joseph could have done whatever he wanted with them? Of course. They could have rotten in the prison in Egypt, and nobody would know where they are. But he has forgiven them. When a Jewish rabbi immigrated to the United States some time ago, <clears throat> and he was asked, actually he made an astonishing statement. He said, before coming to America, I had to forgive Adolf Hitler. He said, I did not want to bring Hitler inside me to my new country. As I said before, when you keep on somebody, someone else's grudge or envy or hate, you are that person's captive or servant, unless you forgive it. As Louis Smith says, the first and often the only person to be healed by forgiveness is the person who does the forgiveness.
And I know it's hard. Sometimes we say, well, I remember what he or she has done to me. But Joseph has forgiven them. I think this was enough because in, in the last, in, the, in chapter 45, verse 1, that Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him and he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. Now, just to remind you, Joseph is a, is a type of whom? Of Christ. Did Jesus sometimes order that people would get out and he would have some privacy with his disciples and the family? Do you see a parallel here? The same. When he revealed himself, he didn't want any Egyptians around. He didn't want any servants. He wanted himself and his siblings. And the moment came. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto the brethren, his brethren, I am Joseph. Do, do my, does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him. For they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near to him. Who said, Come unto me, you that labor and are tired? Jesus. Joseph says the same, Come near to me. I am Joseph. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Christ says, Come unto me, all that you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Actually, there was a big secret in Canaan for years. You know what is that big secret? That Joseph was not devoured by a wild animal, but he was sold. Now, this secret was supposed to be revealed. And it came that they couldn't believe their own eyes that the same governor that put them in jail, that then sent them home, didn't take money, invited Benjamin. Now, this very one is Joseph. Probably he put away his costume. He said, come unto me. I am Joseph. Let me hug you. Let me kiss you. The moment came, the D-Day, the big day, the victory day. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 230. Joseph was satisfied he had seen in his brothers the fruits of true repentance. Upon hearing Judah's noble offer, he gave orders that all but this man should withdraw. Then weeping aloud, he cried, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? He was missing his papa for so many years. And especially his brother Benjamin. And now the family reunion came with his siblings. Brethren, when you read... Um, and, and I, I like also a couple more verses, 14 and 15. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. So they had some intimate time, some chat together. And they shared some stories and, and many other things. And then verse 9 and 24 says, Hasty and go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith this, thy son Joseph, God have made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And he said unto them, See that you fall not out by the way. Who is the one that first calls unto him and then sends away? Doesn't Jesus do the same? He says, come unto me. And then he says, what? Matthew 28. He says, go into all the world. Go and preach the gospel. Joseph did the same. He says, come unto me. He hugged them. He gave them assurance. He says, you come here. I will provide food for you, your families, your cattle, everything. And then he says, go and bring everybody. Brethren, for you that are this morning 
in the congregation, for all of those that are watching. Perhaps you have a brother or a sister. Perhaps you have a parent or a child. Perhaps you have someone in your family and God is addressing to you today. If you are holding some grudge, if you still didn't forgive your brother or sister, it comes Joseph that says, I forgave you. Don't be afraid. Let it go, brethren. When you will do exactly as Joseph and Jesus did, they were crucifying and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know that what they are doing. When you will do that, you will be released. You will be forgiven yourself. This is the good news, brethren, when you read the story of Joseph. There is nothing better than a forgiven soul by our Lord Jesus Christ. May our God, and I'd like to see the last slide. <clears throat> it says, hurt people, hurt other people. Forgiven people, forgive other people. Maybe this be our experience that we personally, individually, would experience forgiveness from our Father in heaven. And as a result, we would show and forgive others. Amen.